Well, it's not hard for any of us to think of all the things that are difficult and hard during this COVID season. But I think a helpful discipline for us is every now and then to pause and reflect and thank God for the good things, the ways we have seen him work during the COVID season. Whenever I do that as pastor here at Chapel Street Church, one of the things that comes immediately to my mind is how generous God's people have been. The faithfulness of so many of you to the mission of God here at Chapel Street Church. And we're so grateful for that. You know, years ago, Pastor Brian and I preached a sermon series on generosity, and we defined generosity as freedom from smallness of heart. And I think that's really true. When life gets difficult and hard, it's a tendency for all of us to look inward, to worry about ourselves first. But to be generous means to look outward and to think, how can I make a difference? What can I give toward God's work in the world? And so many of you have that freedom from smallness of heart, and we are so thankful for your generosity. We want that to be true of us as individuals and as a church family. One of the ways we try to promote generosity is every year during the Advent season, we choose a Serve the World partner to highlight, to tell you their story about how they're making a gospel impact and transforming lives, and then to call our church family to be generous to that cause. So you're going to see a video here in a few moments that highlights our Serve the World Advent partner this year called Naomi's House. I can't wait for you to hear their story, not just today, but in the days and weeks ahead to see what God could do through our collective generosity. Let's watch this together. She was treated as if she was a piece of property and her only job was to make money by the use of her body and then she'd have to give all of that money to her trafficker. I remember in my head thinking, I didn't deserve to have people champion me because I've done so many wrong things. How do we restore what was lost in the ugliness and the violence of trafficking all it takes is that one person to believe that you can do it. And then you actually start to believe yourself that you can do it. Naomi's house exists because we believe that every woman who has been commercially sexually exploited deserves a new start. So we just keep showing up and we keep showing them the gospel. Because if you've never experienced unconditional love, how do you understand a God who loves you in that way? You know, we love Naomi's house here, and I can't wait for you to hear more of their story. As you heard just a moment ago, Naomi's house exists because the God of unconditional love, the God of the second chance and the new start, uh, and they're living examples of that happening in these women's lives. And so we're going to tell you their story and invite you this week and over the next four weeks of Advent to give to our Serve the World partner, Naomi's house. We have a goal to raise $200,000 and help them build a facility for uh, day treatment for some of these women. It's a remarkable opportunity, and we have a big goal, but we serve a big God, and we've been a generous church family. So I want to encourage you, anytime throughout Advent, you can give in addition to your regular gifts to Serve the World and all that money that we raise for Serve the World this Advent season We'll go to Naomi's house and much more to come as we roll out their story to you. Let's pray together as we start. Father God, thank you that you are the God of second chances and new starts. You are the God of unconditional love. And all of us need that, regardless of how put together we look on the outside. We're all broken on the inside and we're grateful that you are a God of grace. So we now speak to us as we begin this new sermon series. Now speak to us about your grace through your son Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, it's hard to believe this is the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, it seems like it's come so soon, but I'm sure for many of you, like for me, uh, 2021 can't come soon enough for you. Advent is meant to be a season of preparation, not the cultural commercial preparation that's been going on uh, well, for months and months, but spiritual preparation. We prepare our hearts and our lives and our homes to celebrate the coming of Christ into the world. His arrival his advent. Our series is called Home for Christmas. It has a unique connotation uh, during COVID season. We didn't necessarily anticipate that many of us will be home, literally, for Christmas. But traditionally, this Christmas season, the holiday season, is a time when we talk a lot, sing a lot, think about home. Um, in fact, the lists of songs and movies that play on this theme of home would be endless. It might be a fun game for you to try to go through some of all the, the popular songs and movies uh, during Christmas time that have the word home in them. In fact, let's play a little bit together now. First, of course, the classic I'll Be Home for Christmas, the contemporary version by Michael Buble. Is it me or does he look like he's kind of creepy lurking around the corner there? I'm not sure what he's up to. Uh, then the, the traditional version with, uh, we have um, with Bing Crosby and his Remarkable blue eyes there. 
Um, Mariah Carey's Baby, Please Come Home. Slightly less popular than her um, All I Want for Christmas is You. Uh, and then the classic Home for Christmas, Amy Grant's Christmas album, Hugging the Birch Tree, Looking Pensive. Um, and then the classic song, There's No Place Like Home for the Holidays. Because no matter how far away you roam, if you want to be happy in a million ways for the holidays, you can't beat Home Sweet Home. And then uh, it would be, we could t- spend all sermon long listing all of the Hallmark Christmas movies that have home in the title. So I'll just give you one because frankly, all Hallmark Christmas movies are essentially the same movie anyway. Ho- Coming home for Christmas. And I believe that's Winnie from the Wonder Years. At least it looks like it to me. Anyway, didn't know she was in Hallmark movies, but some of you Hallmark fans will know that. And then in 1990, the classic of all classics, Home Alone. What is it about home and Christmas? What is it about our, this desire to be with those who know us, with friends, with family, a pl- in a place of belonging and safety and acceptance? Familiar sights, sounds, smells. We have romanticized this idea in our culture. We've also commercialized it, quite frankly. But there's something deeper going on here. Something far deeper, something quite spiritual, in fact. And this is what this series is going to be about. We're going to explore the biblical theme of home and longing for home and what that means for us, the biblical understanding of home, how we lost our home, why we long for it, and how we can return to it. We hinted at this last week in our sermon, Jesus and Hope, as we wrapped up our series, The Politics of Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, we talked about the groan of unfulfilled desire, the longing we all have for a better world, for creation and for ourselves to be set right, because the world we live in is not the world as God intended it to be. But have you ever stopped to ask, well, Why did God create the world in the first place, especially knowing it was going to go wrong? Why create the world at all? Why did he do that? Was God bored? Was God just lonely? No, God was not lacking anything. But out of his perfect and complete fullness within himself, the triune God overflowed onto the canvas of creation, displaying his glory and his perfection. God the Father we see is the author of creation. God the Son in John chapter 1 and Colossians 1 is the active agent of creation. And God the Spirit, the sustainer uh, and one who brings life in creation. Let's read this quote from Jonathan Edwards' essay, The Ends for Which God Created the World. This is uh, a little, he's a Puritan writer and a little heady, but it's really profound. Answering the question, why did God create the world? What God aimed at in the creation of the world as the end which he had ultimately in view was that communication of himself, which he intended through all eternity. There are many reasons to think that what God has in view in an increasing communication of himself through eternity is an increasing knowledge of God, love to him, and joy in him. And it is to be considered that the more those divine communications increase in the creature, that is us, the more it becomes one with God. For so much the more is it united to God in love. The heart is drawn nearer and nearer to God, and the union with him becomes more firm and close. And at the same time, the creature becomes more and more conformed to God. The image is more and more perfect, and so the good that is in the creature comes forever nearer and nearer to an identity with that which is in God. Edwards is saying the reason God created the world is himself. He is the end for which he created the world. And we are to be drawn into him through his creation as part of his creation. That's what he's after, that we are to reflect his image and joy in him. So beautiful creation, no death, no disease, no sorrow, no shame, perfect relational harmony with God and with each other between man and woman, between man and woman and God. And there's only one rule. Do you remember this? Just one rule. We'll call it the garden rule. Now, you may know about the golden rule. This is the garden rule. It's a term I made up. The garden rule because it's the rule in the garden, the Garden of Eden. It's not ambiguous. It's not vague. Just one simple, clear rule God gave Adam and Eve to follow. Here it is, Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's it. That's the rule. Doesn't require any interpretive skills. It's not, uh, it's not hard to discern. It's not vague. It's not like, well, what does this actually mean? Just don't eat the fruit of that tree. 
That's it. One, one rule, one job. It doesn't sound too hard, but every parent who's given your child one instruction knows it's difficult. I once had a man uh, offer this objection. He was a skeptic to the faith, and he said, well, okay, but God knew what was going to happen, and he knew the consequences. That'd be like me as a father putting a loaded gun on the kitchen table and saying, kids, you can do anything you want in the kitchen, just don't touch that gun. Doesn't that make me a bad father? Interesting question. God is not playing a cruel joke. This is not a setup. The tree is there and the corresponding rule is there to show us that from the very beginning, obedience to God brings joy. It is in submission and obedience to our creator that we find fullness and joy in life. But we don't get too far in the story before things fall apart, literally, and before all that is good turns bad. We call the gospel good news, the UN Gelion, the good news, the glad tidings of God's grace and mercy and love in Jesus Christ. And it is good news. But before it can be good news, it must be bad news. In his book, Telling the Truth, the gospel is fairy tale, tragedy, and comedy. Frederick Buechner writes this, before the gospel can be received as good news, it must be announced as bad news. Meaning, we, we understand this, right? If, if you get a good news doctor report saying it's not cancer, that's only good news because the possibility that it might have been. You're waiting for the results back. You get good news about a job. It's only because the, the bad news of being out of work. We have to understand the bad news. So most of this sermon is going to be about the bad news. This is bad news week. Sorry. If you're here tuning in and you uh, were hoping it was going to be a feel-good, uh, touchy-feely, warm, fuzzy sermon for the start of Advent, that's next week. Sorry about that. <laughs> All kidding aside, the more you are able to truly understand the depth of, this, of Genesis 3, this bad news, the better and more glorious the good news of God's grace will be to you. And to be honest, we kind of live in the bad news side of life. That's where we reside most of the time. So let's look at first the enemy's lie. We're going to look at Genesis 3 and first the enemy's lie. Now don't let your presumptions, we all think we know this story. Yeah, yeah, there's a snake and he lies and Eve's tricked and I get it. But sometimes our familiarity and our Presumption can cause us to miss the depth of what's going on here. What went wrong and what is wrong still begins with a deception, a lie that we really need to understand. Let's look at Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord God had made. Serpent is the personified presence of Satan, the evil one, the deceiver. doesn't mean that all snakes are the devil. It means in this case, Satan is personified in the serpent. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now let's unpack this a little bit here. Where's the lie? Did you catch it? Where is the lie in this passage? He said to the woman, did God actually say? There it is. The lie begins with calling into question the word of God. Sin begins in us by questioning the word of God. Because if Satan can get you to doubt the word of God, then he can inevitably get you to doubt the person and the character of God. Remember, the serpent is a created being. Satan is a created being, a created thing calling into question the good word of the creator. This is how sin works. Notice that Satan twists God's word. He says, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Did God say that? No. No, he didn't say that. He said you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Satan is clever enough to put a portion of truth and just twist it enough. And the woman responds. So Satan moves from questioning the word of God, now then at the end, to questioning the intent of God. He says, you will not die. What's, he, what's the implication? God's not telling you the truth. God can't be relied on. God's holding out on you. Sin doesn't just happen, friends. It happens because somewhere in our minds, and in our hearts, we begin to doubt the truth and trustworthiness of God's word. Interesting in her response, Eve says something that God never said. She said, 
We must not eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. God didn't say they couldn't touch it. It may seem like a minor point, but she's adding something there that God did not say. Here's the point I want to make. We assist the evil one in his deception of us when we are confused about what God's word actually says. The underlying implication here is that God is not good and God cannot be trusted. God's not telling you the truth. Now, Satan is the liar. He's the deceiver. And he's effectively calling God the liar, flipping it all upside down. If we're to believe that God is lying to us, then who's the one telling the truth? The one who is the liar, the evil one. This is how sin works in our minds, in our hearts. This ancient story is so profound for us. When's the last time you thought God was lying to you? I know you'd never say God lied to me, but I bet if, I, if you think about it, you behave that way. Every time you withhold unforgiveness forgiveness from somebody, you refuse to forgive them, there's a part of you that's doubting the truth of what God has said, that he has freely forgiven you and you can freely forgive others. Every time you strive to earn his favor, to be good enough in your effort, there's a part of you that's not believing the truth of what God has said is that he has already accomplished your salvation and loves you perfectly through Christ's work on the cross. Every time that you're in a destructive relationship and you know it isn't good for you or the other person, but you, you hold on to it. Why? Because there's a part of you that does not believe that God is really enough for you, that you need someone else. Sin begins in our hearts when we doubt the truth of what God has said. How different would your life be if you deep in your soul believed that God is always telling you the truth in his word? This brings us to the fateful choice. The fateful choice. The final and most enticing deception was that Eve would become like God. The serpent says, you'll become like God. What an intoxicating thought. What an idea. We could become like God just by eating the fruit of a tree. We can become like the creator of the tree himself. Who wouldn't want that kind of a wisdom and authority and power? I'll tell you who wouldn't want it. Anyone who's not willing to disobey God to get it. Let me put it this way. Anything that requires disobedience to God is not worth having to begin with. Anything that requires you disobeying God to get is not worth possessing. Let's look at verse 6. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and it was to be desired to make one wise. Notice this. It was good, it was a delight, and it was to make you wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband, who was with her. We'll come back to that in a minute. And he ate. There's so much in this simple verse. She saw that it was good for food. It was a del delight to the eyes. It would make her wise. So she, she's being set up here that she's questioning the word of God, the intent of God, the heart of God. It looks good. Sin always looks good. Which of us thinks, I've never heard someone say, you know, I just decided that looks so terrible and corrupting. I knew it would make me sick, soul sick. I knew it would destroy my relationships and blow up my family. And I thought, yeah, let's do it. That's not how it works. But here's the truth. What she's looking for in the fruit is what she already has in relationship with God. He is good and sustains us. He is a delight to our eyes. He is the source of wisdom. How tragic that we would sacrifice that which we already have in Christ for that which we cannot get from something created. And that's what's happening here. This too is part of the deception. Notice that Eve only observes good qualities about that which God said would kill her. Sin always looks good, or at least it looks harmless to us. She took it and she ate it and gave some to her husband who was with her. What was Adam doing? He's with her. God gave him the command. Was he distracted? Was he looking around at all the creation that he'd named? He's there with her. What he should have been doing was defending her, fighting with her against the deception and the lie for obedience to God. But he doesn't. And they both fall into sin. These brings us to the tragic consequences. The tragic consequences. We're told, uh, Satan says that you will know good and evil. Your eyes will be opened. You'll know good and evil. And that's a partial truth. And that's how the deception works. It's always partial. It is partially true because prior to eating the fruit, they only knew good. 
And now they do know good and evil. Their eyes are opened in a way. But what they weren't told is they will not know good and evil in the same way as God. Because Adam and Eve and we know evil experientially by doing it, by sinning. God does not know evil that way because God never sins. God knows evil the way a surgeon knows cancer. He knows all about it, but doesn't experience it. We know it, evil, as the sick patient who's dying on the table. In fact, in their sin and having their eyes open, they become less like God. Here's the other deception. It is God's desire to make us like him. He says, you'll become like God. Yes, that's true. In Ephesians, we're going to read later on that God did create us to be like him in true righteousness and holiness. But he's the one who makes us like him. We don't grab that for ourselves or do that for ourselves. Let's look at verses seven through eight. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloth. Now they were naked the whole time. This is not the first time they've been naked. They never had any clothes on. These are the first time clothing shows up and covering shows up. Why? Because the immediate consequence of their rebellion against God is shame. Covering up, hiding from each other and from God. It had never happened before in human history. And now they're ashamed. And now they hide from each other and from God. This is, it's personal sin always has communal consequences. It's common to hear people say things today, well, why is it wrong if they're not hurting anybody? I mean, she's not hurting anybody. If, if he wants to live that way, that's his choice and he's not hurting anybody. That's a lie too. The Bible's clear that our sin always has communal consequences. It's not, we're never just hurting ourselves. Where you are with God impacts how you are with other people in ways we don't perceive and don't see because we're blinded to it. And I think verse eight, this verse right here, is, is the most tragic verse in all the Bible. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hid from the presence. How tragic. They hid from the one who loves them and who made them in his image. Now, as a side note, sin also makes you dumb because they're hiding themselves among the trees. Think about that for just a minute. They're hiding among the trees from the creator of all the trees. It's not going to work. They're not going to be able to hide but again, they're deceived. Can you hide from God? How can you hide from God? And yet, we're still trying. We're still sewing fig leaves together and covering ourselves up. I see this all the time. All of our hard work, all of our striving, all of our projection onto social media. It's, these are all fig leaves. These are all ways to try to make ourselves feel like we're good enough to cover up our shame. We're told that God is walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Notice, he's walking. He's not running. He's not chasing them down in anger. He's not stomping to scare them. He's walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The presumption is he's been doing this their whole life with him. And this time they hide. He's walking as if to say that even in your sin, even in your rebellion, the presence of God is not to be hidden from but to be welcomed because he's gracious. He comes to them. Let's look at verses 9 through 12. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? If you like to highlight or underline or star in your Bible, this is one worth thinking on, meditating on, underlining. We'll come back to that question. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Look at that. Fear, nakedness, hiding. There it is. There's the shame, the consequences, the flow of sin. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you gave me. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me. She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. The serpent did it. Do you see what's happening here? Blame. 
God says, what, is it, what have you done to Adam? Adam says, oh, the woman, it's her fault. You put her, it's not my fault. God, you put her here. I mean, look at her. She's so attractive. I was, dis, I was confused. I was distracted. I didn't know what was going on. It wasn't my fault. He says, the woman, what have, oh, the serpent, he deceived me. This also is a consequence of sin, our blame shifting and our blaming. One of the most profound and hopeful verses in the Bible, verse eight is a tragic verse. Verse nine is a hopeful verse because God calls out, Adam, where are you? Eve, where are you? Where are you? Now, God is both omniscient and omnipotent. He knows all, and he's in all power, and he's omnipresent, meaning he's, he's everywhere at all times. So he's not asking because he's confused about their location. He knows exactly where Adam is. And friends, he knows exactly where you are right now, even in your hiding. He knows where you are. And yet, I believe he asks the same question to you and to me. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you with God? Are you hiding? Are you angry with him? Are you running from him? Are you trying to cover up? God asks you, not because he's out to get you, but because he's pursuing you in his love. It's not a question of location. He knows where we are. He knows where Adam is. It's a question of spiritual condition. God wants to draw Adam and us out from hiding into the open where he can deal with us. He's asking us the same question. Now, we don't have time to get into all the rest of what happens later because there's the the curse in the next several verses, the next uh, nine verses, but suffice it to say that the curse pronounced to the serpent, then to Adam, and then to Eve is effectively a reordering of creation to be what we experience today. That there's a cosmos in chaos now. That the life that they're going to experience is not going to be like the garden. It's going to be marked by toil and sweat and blood and pain and struggle and difficulty and striving against the world, the earth itself, against each other, enmity between each other, and against God. That's going to be the characteristic of their life outside of Eden. Let's go to verses 20 through 24 because this is shifting us back to when we talked about this idea of of being at home. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Do you remember when Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves and tried to clothe themselves, but they couldn't do it? This is the mark of God's grace. He clothes them in their shame in their nakedness. And as a matter of fact, this theme of God clothing us, clothing us is going to run right through Scripture all the way to Revelation, that God must cover us uh, with, with His grace. We see it in the sacrificial system, in the skins of animals. We see it in the New Testament uh, by the blood of Jesus covering us. And we see it in Revelation with the white gleaming garments of those that are redeemed. God must clothe you. All of our life, we're trying to cover ourselves. And God is saying, you must let me do it. So that's the first hint of it there. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. Lord God sent us out. There's no going back. And he drove out the man at the east of the garden of Eden. He placed the cherub and a flaming sword turning every way to guard the way. There's no return. We are spiritually homeless in this world. We are spiritually homesick as well, longing for it. Several things to notice here. God covers them. We said that already. And in verse 22, God would not allow them to continue because they're in sin and separation from God and isolation from each other and rebellion. And God does not want them to live forever in this state. He wants to make a way for them to return. So it's actually a mark of God's grace that he drives them out. Because otherwise they would eat of the tree of life and live forever, forever in a state of sin and separation from God and isolation from each other. God loves us too much to leave us that way. So he casts us out. And in verse 24, there's no going back. Our condition is to be homeless and homesick. Let me read to you a quote from C.S. Lewis's great sermon called The Weight 
of glory. I've quoted this many times before, different portions of it. It is fantastic. And he puts this spiritual homesickness better than anybody I know. In speaking of this desire for our own far-off country, which we find in ourselves even now, I feel a certain shyness. I'm almost committing an indecency. I am trying to rip open the inconsolable secret in each one of you, the secret we cannot hide and cannot tell, though we desire to do both. We cannot tell it because it is a desire for something that has never actually appeared in our experience. We cannot hide it because our experience is constantly suggesting it. Our commonest expedient is to call it beauty and behave as if that had settled the matter. But the books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them, it only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, and news from a country we have never yet visited. I can't even read those last couple of lines without getting emotional. That is the human experience. I long for something. I can almost taste it. I can almost hear it. I'm not quite sure what it is or what it is. And so I look for it in other things, created things, and they make my heart sick, deeply disappointed. They turn into dumb idols. This is the story of Genesis 3. We are homesick and homeless and this is what the writer of Ecclesiastes means in verse, ch chapter 3, verse 11, when he says that God has made everything beautiful in its time and he has put eternity into man's heart, yet he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. There's an eternal hunger, an eternal longing for home. That's our condition. And I think sometimes it's in the Christmas season with all of its nostalgia that we acutely feel this longing. Especially perhaps for those of you where home, your physical home, your earthly home is a painful place. Maybe it's a place that doesn't have good memories. Maybe it's a place of wonderful memories and you're estranged from them, you're separated, you can't go home. For all of us, there's a gnawing and a hunger that even the best earthly home doesn't satisfy. There's something more. And Genesis 3 is telling us what that is. What it is we lost but I don't want to leave you wallowing in all the bad news. The remarkable thing that all along the way, throughout Genesis chapter 3, there are these little glimpses, little tastes, little hints of what God is going to do about our sinful and rebellious and homeless condition. That even in the midst of the curse and the judgment and the sin, there are hints of his grace. For example, God punishes Adam and Eve, but does not destroy them, though he would have been just in doing so. There are consequences, but they're not ultimate consequences yet. God pursues them in their rebellion. He searches for them in their hiding. He calls to them when they are running from him. He covers them in their shame. And all of this is pointing us to one central thing that God is going to do. And we get this remarkable hint of it here in Genesis 3 verse 15. I will put enmity, this is, God is speaking to the serpent here, between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The he and the his is referring to the offspring of the woman. Who is this that will crush the head of the serpent, our enemy? Who is this descendant of Eve that will achieve this victory, that will strive against the forces of evil and ultimately crush them? You know who it is. It is Jesus, the one whom we celebrate. Isn't it amazing that right here in, in, in Genesis chapter 3, the story of how it all went wrong, there's a hint of how God is going to put it right? That's the rest of our series. Come back and we'll unpack what it means to live with this longing and how to be restored to this home and what God's plans are for us in our heart's true home. Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you for this remarkable truth. And right now, I pause and want to pray for anybody watching or listening 
who feels spiritually homeless. I know, God, there are people right now hearing these words who recognize that they are lost. They are far from you. And they long to be set right. They long to be restored. And perhaps they even doubt that it's possible. God, would you speak to them by your grace and remind them that they can be restored to right relationship with you. They can be brought home through you, Jesus. Would you give them the words to pray a simple prayer right now? Lord God, I have rebelled and I'm full of shame and I hide from you and I try to blame shift on others, but I have made the mess. I have done the wrong. And I receive now the grace that you offer, which you promised long ago and made good on in Christ at the cross. I receive that grace and forgiveness. Lord Jesus, I want to come home. Amen. If that's you, if you prayed that prayer with us, I want you to know that you can truly be home for Christmas. Not just physically, but spiritually home in the presence of the God who loves you. Would you let us know that? Reach out to us via email, text in the comment section. We would love to pray with you, to follow up with you, and perhaps help you find a a home and a place of belonging here at Chapel Street Church. Thanks. Merry Christmas to all of you, and go in peace.